Hello everyone, this is David Saffer. I'm a photographer and professional printmaker. I'm, I live in Southern California near Los Angeles. I'm your host today for Introduction to Color Management for Photographers sponsored by Datacolor. And we're going to get started with our session right now. Now, just as an introduction, most photographers feel that they have only limited control over color management. And I think that that's in large part an issue of, of, you could almost call it intimidation, is that in the past, you know, say four or five years ago, when all of us were still struggling with getting used to digital and that sort of thing, that people looked at color management and went too hard, too complicated, um, too intricate, inconsistent, et cetera, et cetera. And now, the way the software and the hardware have been put together, it's greatly improved. Um, you can get significant improvements in accuracy and consistency for a very modest amount of effort. The improvements in particular in the software make it very easy to have a guided experience that gets you a really good result. Um, some of the tools that we're going to be talking about today, and of course I'll get into the details on each one, are the Spider 4, which comes in three flavors, and the Spider Cube, the Spider Checker, and the Spider Print. The Spider 4 is a display calibration device. The Spider Cube is a color balancing device that also is used for other purposes. The Spider Checker is a patch target device that comes with software that allows you to make camera profiles. And Spider Print helps you make custom paper printer profiles. Now some of the examples of things that you can control using this technology include your uh, exposure, control of your black and white points, um, color profiling, color balance, uh, greatly improved efficiency in post-production, and more. Now, color managed workflow really has one purpose, if you come right down to it, and that's to make sure that your image is sparkle from start to finish. And that's an important point, is that you, the goal here is not to go through the exercise of reviewing the technology. The goal here is to help you produce images that really pop, that get that wow factor for your customers and clients. From camera to display to print, you want to be in the driver's seat in every aspect so that your images do sparkle and you can be proud of them. Now, before we get started in the meat of this, I want to ask a quick um, level setting question. I'd like to know what your involvement in photography is. So if you would kindly answer this poll, beginner or advanced amateur, part-time pro or full-time pro. And we'll just pause for a minute here and see what sort of results we get. Okay, it looks like 4% uh, are beginners. We have just over 60% are advanced amateurs, 24% are part-time pros, and 11% are full-time pros. Thanks very much. Okay, so moving along. Here's a tip for you for Photoshop um, that I, I, this is not necessarily directly related to the technology that you're using, but it will have an effect on your Photoshop editing Photoshop comes out of the box, or out of the download, if you will, um, set up in a way that's not really intended for photography. And in fact, on the right-hand side here, here's my mouse cursor, it says more options on that button, and about half of this dialog box is not showing. So the first thing you do is click on that options button, and you get all the rest of this material down here, sort of from the, from the, you know, the midpoint down. The first thing you want to do is set your working space correctly, and it's typically, the working space is typically set to something like what you see under CMYK. It's um, North American or North American Swap or something like that that's related to magazine publishing, for example. And what really, we really want is a working space that's related to photography. Now, you can work in Adobe 98, be perfectly fine. A lot of printers are heading towards producing a color gamut that's very close to Adobe 98. Or if you want a wider gamut, little takes a little bit more experience to work with ProPhoto RGB, can, you can experiment with that. And you leave the rest of these alone and drop down to where it says color management policies. It does not say preserve embedded profiles. You want to change all of these to preserve embedded profiles and ask when opening or pasting. 
Here's the reason. If you happen to get an image file and you either don't remember what the color, um, the, the, the color profile, the, the color space of that image is, or someone has given you an image and you don't know what it is, you really don't want Photoshop to take it and blindly convert it to whatever your working space is. You want it to ask you if you want to make that conversion. And so what happens when these are all enabled is a little dialog box will pop up and it'll say, do you want to do this? And then you can make your decision based on what your goals and objectives are about what you want to do with that particular um, image in Photoshop. Down below you can see where you need to go in terms of conversion options, Adobe Ace. Um, start with perceptual rendering intent. Um, some people use saturation. And leave these three boxes checked. Uh, I believe those are the defaults. Now, as you expand your capabilities in color management, you're going to improve your on-screen quality, accuracy, and consistency. And I think the big thing here is, in, in this particular slide, is that you're going to improve your screen-to-print match. Nobody wants to be in a position where they're making a print and bringing it back to the screen and adjusting the image so that the print will move what you really want to do is be able to make prints on the first try that come very close to what your screen looks like. The print tweak, print tweak cycle, an 8 by 10 costs you a dollar and a half per print. You do four or five of those and suddenly you've got some real money going if you've got a folder full of images that you're printing. So you're looking for ease of use and flexibility and real power in color management so you don't have to do that and make sure your images sparkle from start to finish. Now, the first thing to do is calibrate your display. Now, a lot of people do this. Um, it's interesting that um, depending on the audience, sometimes I'll get the majority of people who are already doing this, and, and sometimes I'll find the majority of people are not. But calibrating that display is one of the most important things you can do to lock down your color and make your life easy. What you do is, first of all, um, you take the software disk from the Spider 4 device, and you put it in the tray, and you plug in the Spider 4 device itself via USB port, and you make your installation. The wizard will ask you to choose your display type, and typically amongst us, we're going to be looking at a laptop or an LCD. You're going to choose the correct um, display type, and you're going to click on the next button, which is on the lower right. And you're going to see a screen like this. Now, the first time you see this, the recal and check cal um, choices are going to be grayed out. You won't be able to do that. The, the software wants you to do a full calibration, which takes probably five minutes, maybe a little bit longer. Sometimes uh, it takes a, a couple of minutes longer than that, but it's not bad. You want to do that full calibration. You're going to leave the gamma to start with at 2.2. These are all the defaults right here. Um, the first two are, excuse me. You're going to set the white point at 6,500, and you're going to set brightness at 120. And uh, talk a little bit about the reason for that. You want to set brightness to 120 because you want to get a good screen to print match. Now, the display comes out of the box. The brightness is going to be set to guarantee it over 200, maybe even over 250 and it's going to be very blue um, before it's calibrated. And the reason you want to get that brightness down is because if the screen's too bright, you're going to be seeing sort of a false picture. Whatever highlight detail is available in your image, you're going to see a false representation of that. If it's too bright, a lot of that's going to go away. You're going to think, I didn't get the exposure right, the image isn't working. That's not necessarily the case. Similarly, if it's too dark, you're going to lose some of that shadow detail. And if, sorry, I meant to say, if it's too bright, you're going to be seeing things in the shadows that really don't come through in the print. What you're trying to do is get that good screen to print match. And somewhere between 100 and 120 is where you want to be. Now, in a brightly lit room, a screen that's set to 120 is going to look pretty dark. So you have to control your ambient lighting. You have to get your ambient lighting down to the point where with the screen set at 120, the screen is the brightest thing in the room. I strongly recommend that you have the room painted in neutral colors, that you cover a bright window. Uh, and if you have a light source in the room, it's a lamp that's not very bright that's somewhere behind you off to the side so you don't see reflections in the screen. 
Now during calibration, um, you would place the spider on the screen, and you can see on the upper right, we're working here in the studio with a tethered setup, and we're calibrating the display with the spider, and when we click next on this screen, we're going to see a series of color patches displayed on the screen. The spider is going to read each color patch. It's going to say, mm, that's too bright, that's too dark, that's too green, that's too yellow, and it's going to record the results of that testing. That record is going to be turned into what some people might call a lookup table or a reference. It becomes the profile for your display, and it corrects the display to the right color every time you start up your computer. So it becomes part of your startup routine automatically. Now the Spider 4 also has, a couple of models of the Spider 4 also have ambient light control where you can leave this plugged into the computer and depending on the room lighting, it will adjust the brightness of the screen up and down. Now this is something that I personally don't use. I would prefer to keep the room lighting under control and I would prefer to keep the screen at the same level of brightness and consistently all the time. And this is up to you. If you're using a laptop and you're moving from room to room, working with clients, sometimes this might be useful. But for general use, if you're, if you're editing images for whatever kind of output, I find that a consistent working environment gives me the best results. Now this is a picture of a working environment, and I included this because this is far from ideal. And I'm sure based on my comments that I made in the last couple of minutes, you can see right away what the issue is. It's that great big bright window that's behind the display. Your color vision, first of all, is going to adjust itself to the window more than the display because the window is the brightest thing in the room. And at different times of the day, and actually I have tried to work in that room, that window is a, is a real headache, um, literally. And what you really want to do is cover the window get those overhead lights turned off and get yourself a small lamp in the corner and get the room brightness down so you can keep the screen under control. So this kind of setup is good as an expedient if you have to do something quickly, but I certainly wouldn't recommend it for long-term use. It's just not going to serve you well. It's going to cause eye fatigue and headaches and all kinds of problems with your color perception. When you're done calibrating the display, there are some graphs and reports that you that are available to you in the software, and I just wanted to show you an example of one. Um, I happen to be lucky enough to have an HP Dream Color display, which is a wide gamut display. It competes with some of the displays that are made by Dell and NEC and LACI and ISO, and you can see here the red outline is the are the edges of the color gamut that the display has been calibrated to. By the way, that sort of teardrop-shaped um, colored object that you see is a graph of human color vision. So even at its best in a wide gamut display, you're still getting not 100% of human color vision when you're looking at um, these devices. Now Adobe 98 is, has a pretty big chunk of this captured. Adobe 98 is a nice color space, works really well. Um, it's only in certain areas that it falls short, and it's perfectly serviceable, particularly if you're making your own prints. There's another software screen, um, the Spider-Proof Comparison, which basically shows you, and the uncalibrated state is in the foreground, and you can see that it's a little bit washed out, not very contrasty, the colors aren't quite right. For example, these greens, at least on my screen, don't look very good, neither do the blues around the church. But in the background, you can see the calibrated view, nice, bright, saturated greens look very realistic. The sky has a great gradation going from bottom to top, and it's very blue. Um, you can see here that the, in the calibrated state, you get a very realistic view of the images that you're working on. Now, one of the interesting things about this particular tool is that they're divided into four quadrants. So you have a group a certain type of images here, you have a group of black and white images here, you have a group of portraits and a group of still lifes with a color chart. If you double click on these, these will zoom out, zoom in, pardon me, and they will fill this space so you can look at them more closely. So you can take a particular type of image and look at the before and after the results of your calibration more closely. 
There's also a tool called Spider Tune. In the Spider 4 Elite, you can take Spider Tune, and let's say you have a laptop and a desktop machine. And you've calibrated them both, and they're just a little bit different. And that's not that unusual. Um, laptops generally have a more limited color gamut, uh, color palette, than the desktop machines do. And what you can do is, is be running this on one of the machines, both if you want to, and simply adjust, and I strongly suggest that you make small adjustments, adjust the screen so that there's a better match between the two. It's for side-by-side -side matching. And when you're done, this will be incorporated into the display profile that the software will generate for you. A bonus that comes with the Spider 4 is Spider Gallery for iPad and iPhone. It's a one-of-a-kind solution. Nobody else offers this. And it corrects the unique color palette of the iPad and the iPhone. Now, it's an interesting thing that um, Apple has created sort of its own color space for the iPad and iPhone. It's not really sRGB, although Apple sometimes refers to it that way or refers to it as Apple. I know they have a number of names for it. But what does happen is that you can bring this color into line so the iPad and the iPhone match pretty nicely. You can carry your images around on both and show them to customers or clients and be confident that the color that they're seeing is true to what you, the point that you edited to and the work that you want them to see. It's pretty simple. Um, you work through a wireless network. You plug the USB uh, cable into your laptop or desktop, and you put the spider on the iPad or iPhone. And you're also going to make sure that they're both on the same network. They're going to talk to each other. The, three, the two of them are going to talk to each other via the network. And the, the spider um, colorimeter is going to talk to the laptop through the USB cable. It's almost like voodoo. And at the end of the day, you're going to you put the colorimeter where it's supposed to be. At the end of the day, you get very nice result. So if we look at these two side by side, and I'll tell you now that what I did was I took two views of this and um, cropped and composited them in Photoshop so that you could see them side by side. If you look at the uncalibrated view, you can see that the contrast is pretty soft. There isn't much definition in her hair. There's um, same thing goes for her eyes and eyelashes, and of course, in the highly saturated flowers, there's some detail lacking. And yet, in the calibrated view, the colors really pop in the flowers. The skin tones are nice. Uh, there's quite a bit of detail in her hair, eyebrows, and eyelashes, and her eyes are beautiful. And you can see these primary color patches, there's significant differences between them, particularly in terms of contrast. So you take something that's very nice, nothing wrong with the iPad, but really turn it into something that can become a, a showcase for your work. Now I have another poll question for you. Take a little break here. Do you calibrate your display? Um, the first answer is no. The second is you're thinking about it. The third is once or twice a year. And the last one is frequently every month or every other month. Okay, interesting results. About half the people here calibrate every month or every other month, about a quarter um, infrequently or once a year, and another quarter are considering it or not doing it. Now, I would encourage you to calibrate your display once a month. I calibrate my displays, my laptop and my desktop, on the first of the month so I can remember to do it. That's probably the only way I'll ever remember to do it. And uh, that serves me quite well. The displays do change over time. The backlight ages a little bit every day. Um, I'll give you a little tip, though. If you have a tendency to leave, your, in particular, your desktop unit turned on, it's, there's no problem with leaving the computer turned on. But turn the display off overnight. Don't use it as a night light or, as a, um, or just leave it there, because that backlight has a limited lifetime. And uh, if it's turned off at night, it'll last longer. I'm going to take a sip of water, excuse me.
Thank you. The spider cube is a multi-purpose device. Um, it's sort of the, um, a descendant of the gray card in a way, or it's a gray card on steroids is what I like to call it. It's a multi-purpose device. Um, you can use it uh, to help you with, in particular, your in-camera white balance, but also in post-production in setting gray point, your white point, and black points, uh, in evaluating your exposure in camera and a number of other things that we're going to get into. Now one of the things that where the spider cube is really quite valuable is setting in camera custom white balance. Now a lot of people tell me that what they do is, and they're shooting raw of course, uh, but they set the white balance in the camera to daylight or fluorescent or whatever. But the thing is, is that the LCD on the back is showing you a semi-processed JPEG, not your raw file. It's processing that image in the camera, and based on that preset that the camera manufacturer built in, it's giving you its best shot at an image that's representative of the scene. But here's the problem. It's semi-processed, and it's not an exact white balance. When you do a custom white balance with the spider cube, it's going to nail the white balance for your lighting condition, and that makes all the difference. So when you're looking at that JPEG on the back, you're going to be able to trust the blinkies, the, the little on and off blinkies that show you whether you're overexposed or not. It's going to show you better saturation and better contrast. Uh, certainly the LCD is not a substitute, for example, for shooting tethered to a real computer, but it will certainly improve the performance uh, and, and the usefulness of what you're seeing on the back of your camera. Now, here's a, di a diagram. I realize that this is something of a, an eye test. I apologize for this, but I wanted to point something out is that because this is something of a pyramid-shaped widget, it's got a right side and a left side, and of course you can see on here that the right side is more brightly lit than the left side. Very, very useful in lighting conditions where, for example, you have a key light, a secondary light, or you have um, bright outdoor light coming from one direction, and so you can see what's going on in terms of lighting direction, and these become very useful measuring points later on. So what one would do in this case is to take a photograph that includes the cube. And I just realized I left something out, and I'm going to back up. When you set that custom white balance, use the instructions that come with the camera. Each camera has a slightly different way of doing it. I forgot to mention that. I apologize. Now, going back to this, you're going to take a photograph that includes the cube, and the photo will capture important information about your shooting conditions that will be very, very useful to you in making basic raw adjustments. So here's a scene with mixed lighting um, using uh, Lightroom 4. We're in the develop module. And you can see that this is a little bit of a horror show. It's got mixed lighting. You have two lamps. Um, we have no idea what kind of bulb is in each lamp, but they don't look good. Um, there's a different kind of lighting coming from the room next door. And if I'm reading this correctly, there's a, another light in the room somewhere off to camera left and behind us that's shining on the bed. That's probably another, yet another light source. So you have a lot of different lights contributing to the scene, and of course it doesn't look very realistic. The easy way to get this to be color balanced is to use the spider cube, and you can see right in the center here, the spider cube is nestled right in the middle of the bed. We're going to take that uh, color eyedropper right here in the develop module. It's in the basic uh, panel. and we're going to zoom in and we're going to click on the br more brightly lit side of the spider cube in the gray area. And that is going to color balance the, uh, the entire image for us, like that. Now, that's pretty amazing that that can do that. And the spider cube is particularly well suited to this because um, unlike a gray card, it doesn't have to be pointed in a particular direction. It's a multifaceted device. We could have clicked on the other side. We can move it around, and we can use it and adapt it to the lighting conditions, uh, multiple lights, for example, lighting conditions in a particular space that we're shooting in. Now, you can also use, of course, the other controls in Lightroom, the ones that you see here where my cursor is moving to make further adjustments to the image. But the basic adjustment right now was 
get that color balance down first and then make your other adjustments to the image. Now in Adobe Camera Raw, it's a somewhat similar process. Um, we're going to take that white gray balance dropper on the upper left. We're going to zoom in on the spider cube and we're going to click on that gray area. And again, it's going to color balance the image for us. We have our controls here on the right um, that allow, and certainly some other controls underneath the toolbars at the top here, that will allow us to fine tune the image and make adjustments as we go. Now we're going to move on to the spider checker. Um, we still have uh, quite a bit of material to cover. The spider checker is a very, very useful uh, color management tool. It really takes that spider cube uh, more than one step further along the path of locking down your color. It's a rigid body uh, clamshell. It contains large pigment-based color patches and they're replaceable. That's an important point is that if they get worn or scratched or faded, you can replace them without having to buy a completely new device. I think that's pretty cool. In fact, on the lower left, there's a fade checker, and that little square of color will change color. When it changes color, it's time to replace these. And then, well, as they're exposed to light, they're going to fade. They're made out of pigments. It's tripod mountable. It will mount the spider cube at the top if you want to use that. And it includes camera calibration software that works as a standalone, or it will work with Lightroom, Photoshop, or Hasselblad's Focus uh, software that's provided with their medium format cameras. Uh, just as a description, the right side has 24 patches. They're near or within the sRGB color space. The left side includes six additional skin tone patches for a total of eight. The left side also has six medium saturation colors to improve color gamut coverage and three white tints and three near black tones. The gray ramps are increased in 10% steps and you have an extra 5 and 95% sample. Now what you do is, and I'm going to get into this in a second, is you're going to photograph this and normalize it, make some adjustments to it so it's it's the within the, a range that the software can handle it and make a color profile for your camera. Much in the same way that one would make a color profile, say, for a printer. But let's take a look at it. You're going to capture an image of the spider checker. Now, when you capture an image of the spider checker, you're going to want to put a key light at about 12 o'clock over the axis of the camera. So it would be directly above the camera and shining down on the um, spider checker in a way that gives completely flat and even light from corner to corner. No reflections, no hot spots, no cool spots, just nice even light. So, uh, you know, a soft box or a diffuser is probably what you want to have going. And you're going to take a shot of that at the correct exposure, okay? And then we're going to normalize it. We're going to talk about how that editing process for a minute open the image in the spiderchecker.app and we're going to export that preset to Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw or Focus. Now there's a couple of tips in here which can be very useful to you in other situations uh, but I'm just going to talk about the spider checker this time. What you want to do in normalizing this is pick these three patches the white patch, the middle gray patch, and the black patch. And you need to know what the RGB numbers are in those. And the easy way to do that, if you look at this expanded view of the, of the tool palette, you can see that there is an eyedropper with a little cross next to it. That will set down a color sampler circle. So every time, if you click on this here, and then you come over here and click on the patch, it will lay down a measurement circle. And you can see I've got one, two, three, and they show up one, two, three, and I believe the limit is five for any given image in this, in this uh, application. Then what you want to do is use your exposure and highlight and shadow controls, et cetera, et cetera, your whites and blacks, to get the values in those patches. And the number one area down here, you want it to be around 10 RGB. If it says 10, 11, 10, don't worry about it. In the middle patch, you want around 120 in each of the categories, and around 230 to 233 in number three. And once you've got that done, 
you're going to save that as a TIFF file and import it into Spider Checker. There's no intermediate step where you have to convert it to a DNG file or anything like that. You're going to import it in here, and you're going to see when you import it that it may not fit exactly right inside this square. Well, you can grab the corners or the edges of this and move it around until each one of these squares is more or less centered in a patch. At that point, you're ready to generate your uh, camera calibration. Now, it does happen sometimes, and I may as well remind you now, sometimes people will put this uh, the spider checker chart out in the studio, and they'll turn it upside down, and that magenta patch will be in the upper right-hand corner. If you see that magenta patch in the upper right-hand corner, somebody goofed up, you have to turn it around and do it over. But if it's upside down, it's not going to work. Okay. So you come over here and you can set your mode, which is your rendering intent, and you can save it to Lightroom or to Adobe Camera Raw and save your calibration. And again, here's an example of an upside down uh, spider checker chart. Once you export this to Lightroom, it's going to appear in your user presets. Well, what do you do with that? Just like any other preset, you can apply it to the image that you're working on in develop mode. And this is actually one that was made by uh, one of my colleagues, David Toby. And you can apply that to that image. You can apply it to all of the images in a folder if they were shot under the same lighting conditions. The same thing applies, although the, the menus look a little bit different, in Adobe Camera Raw. Um, if you click on this little icon here in the upper right in the basic module in Camera Raw, it'll unfold, and you're going to see Load Settings. And when you click on that, you'll get a panel that lists the presets that you've created or that exist on the computer. And you'll pick this color calibration to apply to your image. At that point, that image is ready for additional processing. And again, if you open multiple images in Camera Raw, which I'm sure many of you know about, uh, you can apply the presets to all the images in that folder if they were shot under the same lighting conditions. Very, very useful tool. Now, on the back of the spider checker panels, you can turn them around, and they have a gray panel set up. You have two big panels that are 50% gray, and then you have gray ramps that are the same as the color face of the target in 10% steps. Now, one of the things you can use this for, if you wish, is you can fill the frame and take a picture of this, and with your uh, in-camera white balance, excuse me, and you can set the white balance to your camera in those lighting conditions. So this can also be very useful in that respect. And again, that quick in-camera uh, white balance can be used to ensure that your initial view of images on the back of the camera is optimized. It, it optimizes your semi-processed JPEG previews. Remember, we talked about that earlier. It doesn't necessarily you're not necessarily seeing the raw file in the back of the camera. Remember, you're seeing a semi-processed JPEG. Just keep that in mind. But it will get it closer to what your eye is seeing in the scene than uh, if you had not done this. Now, we're going to move along and talk about printer profiles. Now, spider print is uh, a very, very capable um, technology. And in fact, it's recently been upgraded along with the Spider 4. Uh, it's been uh, it's been around for a while, but it's a very very useful tool. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story. A friend of mine, who is a really hardcore landscape photographer, uh, has been building out his in studio system. He shoots four by five on film and has it scanned um, on an Aztec scanner. Those high bit scans. So he's very much into color and very much into color control. And he was not getting the best results from outside labs. So he went out and bought himself a printer. And when he was using the printer, he educated himself and he started using the printer profiles that were provided by the manufacturer, the ICC profiles. And they were OK. But in certain images, for example, he did some photography in Aspen last fall for very brightly colored, highly saturated aspen trees. Some of the highlight detail was falling out when he was making the print. Um, in fact, it, it was bad enough that he was really upset about it. And I suggested to him that I come over and use the spider print to make a custom profile for the paper that he happened to be using, which was the Ilford um, 
gallery, I think it's the Barita Silk is what it's called. And we got an amazing result, which was that we got back another 10 or 15 percent of the detail and the highlights in those aspen trees. He was thrilled. So, and what you know, what's the reason for that? As long as I'm, I'm getting into this, it's because those canned profiles are made by the manufacturers, and they do an excellent job. Don't get me wrong, but they're made by the manufacturers in a way that sort of averages the results from a number of machines. It's not one machine that you own, it's a gaggle of machines that they own. And they create those averages and they're very good averages. The machines are, the printers are much more stable than they used to be, they're much more consistent than they used to be even three years ago. And they do a very good job, but every printer kind of has its own color fingerprint. That printer is sitting in a different room when you own it, the humidity and temperature are different, the, the environment, whatever air pollution there is in the city that you're in is different. Everything is different for that printer, paper, and ink combination. It makes sense to make a custom color calibration for your printer if you want to get the absolute best results out of your machine. So now you've got a profile that really brings out all the performance from the printer that's possible to get. Now you install the software and you plug the device in and of course on this first screen you could go through some tutorials about color management and printer profiling or you could profile your printer which is what we're going to take a look at. Now there's a number of choices here as far as target goes but you're going to print a number of color patches. Think back to when we calibrated the display the computer showed a series of color patches to the Spider 4, and the Spider 4 read those color patches one at a time and calculated whether they were accurate or not. This is really the same sort of process. We're going to print um, 225 patches for the basic target. It's a high quality target. It's on two sheets, and of course you're going to use the paper that you're later going to be printing your images on. Now, if, you're, if you have images that have a lot of subtle mid-tones or even if you're, you're, you're working with black and white, I suggest that you do the high quality target plus the grays. That's the one that I normally use anyway. That's four sheets. Um, some people complain that it takes too much time to, to read one of these and, and I think, well, given the increase in performance, the fact that it probably takes 15 or 20 minutes to do the whole cycle from beginning to end. Uh, it's well worth the effort. Now you can do the what they call the expert target which is 729 patches or the expert target plus the grays but the fact is is that unless you have an image that's really really pushing the margins of what the printer can do that you really should try the 225 patch target first and see how that goes because I think you'll find 99 times out of 100 or even better that you'll get an excellent result. So you're going to print that target. It's going to come out of the printer. I suggest that you let it dry. In some case, it depends on the printer and the, in the instructions that come with the device, you'll find that there's recommendations for dry out. Um, Epson printers, a lot of people will tell you wait 24 hours. That's not such a bad idea, but you can get away with doing it after an hour if you want to. Um, on the HP printers, they dry in five or ten minutes. It's a different, it's a different kind of ink set in that respect. It dries very quickly. So actually, on the upper left, what looks like a printed chart is actually what you see on the screen. And as you go from right to left or left to right, you're scanning each one of these patches with the the Spider Print device. It's going to flip. If it's going to indicate whether or not you've read that that patch correctly and there'll be a soft chime at the end of each row letting you know that that strip has been read and you can move on to the next one. Also take note that there's a software screen that I didn't show where you can enter your data that says um, what ink set you used, what paper you used, what printer it was, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, so that you can use this for record keeping. You can put this away and say, okay, that profile that I made back on September 19th, this is the paper that I use. 
Um, it's a nice way to be able to double check your work, et cetera, et cetera. I strongly suggest that when you name the profile that you put the paper name and, of course, you include the date that you made it. Um, paper profiles are a little bit perishable. Um, depending on how you operate your machine, you may want to make a new profile when you change out an ink cartridge or, in some cases, a couple of ink cartridges. Um, you're using a new lot of paper or you have an open box of paper that's been sitting around for, let's say, a month or two. As the air gets to it, the paper tends to change slightly. Uh, and so you may want to make another, a fresh profile so that you get the best results possible um, out of your technology. Now, once that profile is created and saved, it's going to be parked on your computer, your Photoshop and Lightroom and everything else will be able to find it. Okay, and spider proof, you have a before and after view, just like we did before, except this time, instead of um, calibrated to uncalibrated, you have soft proof, which is a technical term that's used for a color accurate preview. You can toggle that on and off, and you can see what it looks like with and without the calibration. Now, what do you do with that calibrated profile? Well, one of the first things that you do, and it's, I think is very important, is we have a calibrated display, and we've calibrated our printer. So now we have what we call a characterization or, or an accurate description of both devices. Why not combine those and get a color accurate preview on screen of what your print is going to look like? So what happens is, is you go in Photoshop to Proof Setup and go to Custom, and when you click on that, you're going to get this dialog here and device to simulate. And all of those paper profiles, whether they're from the manufacturer or the ones that you made, are going to show up. When you choose one of these, Photoshop and the operating system are going to work together to create a preview for you of what that print is going to look like. And when you turn this on, it flips over instantly and... and Here's two different views. B is if I had told it I was going to use plain paper, you know, which is not really intended for printing photographs, is flat, low in contrast, low in color saturation, what you would typically expect. But if I'm using glossy or luster paper, look at the difference. You can see in this preview that it's highly saturated, lots of detail, crisp, really pops off the page. Now, what's the advantage to this? Well, the advantage is, is if you turn this on when you start your editing session, you can see what's happening every step of the way as you're editing. You edit, you make a change, you have a pretty good idea of what your print is going to look like. As you go forward, you're going to be making cumulative changes, and you're going to be able to see if you've gone down the wrong path. You're going to be able to see if you made an edit that might not work in print. You're going to, it's basically looking into the future in terms of what your print is going to look like. And this really saves money, time, and space. Now, when you're printing with a profile, it's very straightforward. Um, this is the print settings dialog from CS6. CS5 is not all that different. On the left, in, in CS6, you have a preview of the image that you're going to print. And luckily for us, there's also a soft proofing or color accurate preview. It says match print colors. Now, it's not full size, but it is sort of the last gasp, the last view that you're going to get before you pull the trigger and send this to the printer. It's a very useful thing. But in order for this to work, you have to come over here to printer setup and designate the right printer. Under print settings, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, you have to tell it the right paper. And then down here under color management, you want to change from the default, which is printer managed color, to Photoshop manages colors, or in some applications, application managed color. Then you're going to tell it which profile to use. So now you've told it which printer, which paper, and which profile, and that Photoshop is managing your color. Now the deck, is, the deck <laughs> is stacked in your favor. It's going to make a color accurate preview. At this stage, if you've done everything correctly, you should get a screen to print match that's somewhere in the 90 to 95 percent range. You're not going to be stuck in that cycle of tweak, print, print, tweak, and wasting money and paper and ink. 
you should get an image that's very close to what you see on your screen. Now, of course, if the image looks too dark, going back to what we said about display calibration, if that print looks too dark, your screen brightness is probably cranked up a little too high. Keep that in mind. Now, going back to soft proofing in Lightroom, it used to be in Lightroom versions 1 through 3, there was no soft proofing. And in fact, that was one of the, the gripes that I had about Lightroom. Did a lot of things really well, a lot of things really well, but it didn't give you a color accurate preview. And if you're going to be printing your work as much as I do, that's a problem. Now, you can enable soft proofing in the develop module by simply holding down the command or the control key and pressing S. That's one way to do it. Or, my goodness, that was a really loud noise. Excuse me. Or you can check the box right next to soft proofing. Now, what's this going to do for you? It's going to do exactly the same thing that it does in Photoshop. It's going to combine the profile. And you can see under here, proof settings, profile. And it says sRGB, but I really should have picked a print uh, profile to show you. And you can pick the rendering intent, and it's going to show you on screen, as a soft proof, what your image is going to look like when you print it. And you have all of your normal controls under the basic and the tone curve and the HSL control panels here. And you can go ahead and edit this image to your heart's content, up, up, down, left, and right. And you'll be able to see on the screen what's going to happen to your image in real time. Now, I want to back up a little bit. If you look over here where it says profile, and you can see here it says sRGB. If I go to the next screen, that's actually a drop down. And you can see all of these, um, you can see a few selected profiles. But if you click on other, you're going to see a very long list like we saw in Photoshop. And what you can do is click on any one of these and go and click on this box that's outlined in red and include in your display profiles. And they will subsequently show up as some of your customized go-to profiles for your soft proofing. So you can, instead of having to deal with that long list, this is a very nice feature, you can create a custom list in Lightroom for your soft proofing. And that will give you a very, a very um, short path to getting what you want out of what's showing up on your screen. Now, your color managed workflow really goes from, really has three steps, from camera to display to print. And you can see, of course, we've included a little um, spider cube icon and the display with a little ICC icon above it and print with an ICC icon above that. And the fact is, is that once you get these devices in line, sort of whipped into shape, and it's part of your routine, it turns from something that seems to be kind of a pain in the neck to something that's really seamless, flows smoothly, and gets you much better results. And it really helps you make sure that your images sparkle from start to finish. It's a little bit of effort at the beginning, but once you start to get it locked down, it's really not bad at all. Now, I wanted to tell you a little bit about a product that was announced today at Photokina over in Europe. It's called the Spider Capture Pro. Uh, it's a color, <clears throat> it's a complete color input and autofocus suite. Um, everything that's on the screen here, aside from the case and the device on the right, should be familiar to you by now. The device on the right is called the LensCal, and very briefly, that's used to help you fine tune the focus of your DSLR lenses and camera bodies. Now, this is a very interesting um, ensemble, very efficient way to put it all together, and you can find it at this web address on here. By the way, this, um, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted on the SPIDER website uh, within a week or so. Now, let's talk a little bit about special offers. There's 20% off all Spider products at datacolor.com through September 26th. You need the promo code on checkout. It's lowercase color 20. Okay. And I was going to ask Patty to tell me who the winner is of the, um, I got to 
click on this thing here. Um, let's see, Skip Lightsey. Skip, we will be sending you an email asking you for your um, shipping information. I also see here, I had missed this before, that there was there have been questions about what the difference is between the Spider 3 and the Spider 4. Let's address that real briefly. The Spider 4 is an upgrade to the Spider 3. It's not just a product revision. And in both software and hardware, it's significantly improved. At the end of the day, what you need to know is that it's at least 25% more accurate than its predecessor. So the Spider 3 is a, is a great device, but as we all continue to move forward, particularly with wide gamut displays, we should be thinking about upgrading our display calibration devices, and the Spider 4 is ideal for that purpose. Now I want to again thank Datacolor, um, www.datacolor.com, for kindly sponsoring this session. Um, we had two sessions today. They were very well attended. We're going to continue to have both advanced and intermediate sessions throughout the end of the year and into next year. So watch for the announcements. Um, I also wanted to mention that I have a blog. Uh, it's been a little bit dormant during August because I was at working quite a bit and out of town, so I hadn't had a chance to update it, but that's normally is uh, you're seeing a couple of articles a week in there on technical aspects and of photography, et cetera, et cetera, and there's quite a backlog. There's about 250 articles on there. It's davidsaffer.wordpress.com, and my website is davidsaffer.com. I also want to mention that for any of my students, I'm happy to answer questions. If you want to send me an email, it's at dsaffer at mac.com. Again, that's dsaffir, S-A-F-F-I-R, at mac.com. It, it may be that I miss one or two messages a day simply because I get a lot of emails. If you don't get an answer within 24 hours, please do resend the email. Don't take it personally. It just means that I'm overwhelmed with stuff and I missed an email. Send me another one and I will get back to you. Also, David Toby, who is... Um, one of the senior managers at Data Color has an excellent blog. Uh, he devotes himself uh, to also to camera and color technology, um, color management, cdtoby.wordpress.com. And his website is cdtoby.com. Again, I'd encourage you to watch your emails for continuing announcements about other webinar sessions that we're going to be having. And this webinar will be posted as a recording uh, sometime in the next week. I thank you for your attention. I really appreciate you uh, coming online with us, and I hope you come back soon. Have a great weekend. Bye, everybody.